we we are we were happy to be uh, receiving some some you know some some research uh, on spot research which is still ongoing but uh, it helps us to to feel uh, and to make sense of the the big gap between expectations on ASEAN and also the reality uh, in in some way and uh, with the the issue uh, you have raised it also help us to uh, relate to the next uh, discussion. I am now honored to be a, a co-chair with Ajahn Piti, Dr. Piti Sihanam. Uh, so I also uh, learned that we do have uh, some in input in the chat box uh, for some comments and, and also questions to Ajahn Amitav, Acharya, and Ajahn Rahu, uh, Misra, and Ajahn Surat. So, uh, would would uh, I I see the hands of uh, Professor ba, uh, Prabir De uh, now? Uh, uh, yes. So uh, may I uh, uh, open uh, the the uh, opportunity for Professor ba, Prabir De, and uh, I also hope Ajahn Piti will help me in in this uh, first. Yes. Thank you, uh, Professor Surachai. Thank you very much uh, uh, for. Uh, giving me the floor and first of all I congratulate all the three speakers excellent uh, presentations excellent uh, their papers and setting up the tone for the intercon conference now I have a brief questions to professor Acharya you know he, one of his uh, one of his uh, suggestions or I, I read me put it this one of his recommendations uh, was that he said that ASEAN can be marginalized in Indo-Pacific, if Indo-Pacific is not institutionalized. Um, so if, if, you, if Professor Acharya can tell us, you know, you are a professor, but when you speak to policymakers, if you can give one or two more suggestions that you've been institutionalized, Asia Pacific is an open region and you are right. This has come from the great Peter Dreisden who kept it an open region. So in, your, in this case, if you'd like us to institutionalize Indo-Pacific, given ASEAN interest, what you would uh, like you would like us to do? You know, if you if you guide us, sir, this is my questions for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pabirde. Uh, may I also uh, keeping this uh, important question in mind? Uh, uh, may I now uh, see if. Uh, we can have uh, one or two more related questions. Uh, if... Actually, Ajahn Suresh, hi, Krab. Krab. Currently, so far, we have three questions from the chat box. And I think these three questions are also uh, related to the problem that uh, the questions that Dr. Prabhide just mentioned to us. So let I wrap up these questions and ask Ajahn, Ami, uh, Professor Amitav uh, in, 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 in one, one round. Um, the first question is uh, to Professor Amita Fashia. Since we still do not have a clear definition of Indo-Pacific, could you please give us your own versions of the definitions of these words? And I think this also related to uh, the questions that Dr. Prabhide just asked us. And then the second question is, what is the nature and extent of ASEAN strategic dilemma in connections to the Indo-Pacific? What should ASEAN be concerned with? And the last question is from Professor Niranjan Barak. How robust is India Act East policy under Prime Minister Modi? Any gap between promise and performance? How good has been India COVID diplomacy with, with ASEAN countries, as especially in the interest of Indian uh, PRs and visitors? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ajahn Piti, for, for helping uh, to make it more challenging through the, the three questions. May I now uh, re, uh, turn to our, our uh, keynote uh, of Ajahn Amitav? And uh, if I, in any way other colleagues also would like to join, uh, we can come back to. Please, Ajahn Amitav Acharya. 
Thank you. Um, let me start with uh, Prabhu's question, which is actually very important because uh, uh, the future of Indo-Pacific will depend on that. You know, I, I was trying to make a, a historical observation and I, I'm sure you appreciate what I said that uh, Asia Pacific was created by economists. East Asia was by identity builders like Akim Daijong, Mahathir Muhammad, who didn't like Australia and US to be part of a region. Indo-Pacific is created by strategists. I mean, the, the Indian guy who proposed this idea was a military officer, ex-officer. My friend Rory Metcalf, who is Australian, uh, pushing for it, he's a strategist. Uh, so you can see where these things are coming from. And uh, so how do you then legitimize Indo-Pacific? Uh, and I agree that uh, with uh, what uh, Rahul said, Indo-Pacific is great for India. Uh, so because it puts India on the map. India had been excluded from uh, APEC, uh, partly for its own fault, by the way, because it was not uh, in sync with uh, the liberalization of the kind of economic opening that uh, uh, East Asia did. Uh, but uh, that is already passed and it is high time India got into um, APEC uh, and should be, should be allowed into APEC. But anyway, uh, there was problems with Indian diplomacy throughout the 80s and 90s. India lost interest in Southeast Asia after the uh, Bandung Conference. Uh, India was preoccupied with Pakistan and uh, its internal problems for much of the 60s and 70s. Uh, and uh, But then Narasimha Rao, thanks to his policy, which has been continuing, India redeveloped an engagement with uh, uh, Southeast Asia, which was it's a smart, smart move. But Indo-Pacific is a different kind of a thing. Uh, so uh, it's a different kind of a construct. And because of its strategic orientation, especially the version of Indo-Pacific that is gaining at the moment, and particularly because of the association between Indo-Pacific and Quad, uh, which should not be a natural association, but that's how people think of, uh, especially Americans. When they think of Indo-Pacific, they think of Quad too. It sort of comes across as a, in a strategic concept. So the thing to do is the regions are fluid, artificial most of the time, but they are also constructed. Um, they are a socialization, construction uh, is very important to regions. So that's why institutions are important in social construction of regions. There will be no Southeast Asia, in my view, credible Southeast Asia as a region without ASEAN. ASEAN as an institution gave meaning to Southeast Asia, which was a military construct, by the way, Southeast Asia Command uh, after uh, in, 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 under Mountbatten in, in Second World War. So, so, so the thing to do now is to see what kind of institutions can be built. It's not enough to say, okay, that we have a Mekong Gonga, we have a Bimstek, we have a, uh, but these are not Indo-Pacific institutions. They were not created to cover the entire breadth of inclusive, all the countries of Indo-Pacific. So there is an Indian Ocean framework, but I think there has to be something that can really match in terms of uh, Professor Amitav, could you please turn on your microphone? Your microphone just mute. Okay. Uh, no, what I'm saying is that uh, I hope you heard something what I said. That, uh, that India and the country, regions are artificial, but they can be constructed. And uh, to do that, we need to, to give meaning to, to give legitimacy to Indo-Pacific. There has to be some sort of a institution. It cannot be quad, uh, because quad will never be acceptable to China. It will never be probably acceptable to Indonesia, uh, which is a very important country. So I'm giving you the ASEAN perspective. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I, I know I live in the United States. I was born in India and um, I'm also Canadian, uh, but I <laughs> give you the ASEAN perspective. The, from ASEAN perspective, Indo-Pacific carries the risk of marginalizing it unless there is an institution like uh, ARF, East Asian Summit, where ASEAN is also in the driver's seat. It's not enough to say ASEAN is uh, central to Indo-Pacific. It has to be visible through institutional linkages, just like we have APEC or uh, East Asian Summit. So that's what I was trying to say. It's not impossible, but that's where, you know, uh, the diplomacy and the institution building, region building has to uh, focus on. Uh, and we can talk about it, how maybe you can have a conference on this, what kind of institutions are right for uh, Indo-Pacific. 
Uh, on the question of uh, India's active policy, I must confess that uh, I'm not really a big expert on, on, on this. So Rahul can probably explain to that. But I think um, Indian governments after Narasimha Rao have, have played, paid uh, good attention to uh, Southeast Asia. And initially to Southeast Asia, then it become more East Asia. And, and that, that's a pretty good policy and it has paid dividends. But there is a perception uh, I don't know whether in this conference in Thailand, but certainly if you go to Indonesia, Singapore, you feel that India is not doing enough uh, to uh, pursue its activist policy. Certainly when you, they always compare India with China. Compared to China, India is not seemingly as committed, not doing enough to engage East Asia. So it's a comparative thing uh, rather than, and India's credibility in the ICS survey in Singapore, uh, Trust factor is also not very high, by the way. India is not seen as a threat to Southeast Asia, but it's as a as a as a uh, sort of a country as a great power who can be expected to do the right thing in international affairs is very low. In fact, almost comparable to China. But the reasons are different. India is seen as not being doing enough, as opposed to China, which is seen as actually creating a sense of insecurity in Southeast Asia. Of uh, the point about, uh, therefore, Modi's policy is very good. Although I, I would not always buy what the prime minister says in a conference. I mean, that's, that's, that's what they're supposed to say. All these things that India is not have any strategic intention. Uh, India is uh, normative. I mean, politicians say all these things, but we academics do not take that too seriously. Uh, we should question that. Uh, some, what Modi said, it was an excellent speech in shangri San, dialogue, but you have to take it like all prime ministerial or presidential speeches with a grain of salt. <clears throat> and uh, I don't know whether there was any other question for me, uh, but uh, I just want to highlight one other point that uh, Indo-Pacific is an important concept. It's good for India, uh, but it's not necessarily, it's good for Australia because it also gives Australia a um, you know, very important place in, but I'm not so sure it's all that good for Southeast Asia, uh, unless it's sort of a, you know, it's a, it is built through, legitimized through institution building. And as long as China feels, and uh, whether China is uh, popular or unpopular, as long as China feels Indo-Pacific is a threat uh, to it, it's kind of a containment, I think there will be some ASEAN countries which will not warm to Indo-Pacific. And uh, one should be realistic about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for very your much. very... Thank you very much for your very perceptive uh, and very grounded uh, answer. Uh, may I also uh, request uh, our uh, other two speakers, uh, if you would like to join, because the questions uh, could be also be, be seen from your uh, your your side, please. Uh, uh, before before we pass the mic to uh, Professor Rao Mishla. There are some direct questions, and of course, the, the, also the questions that was passed from, from Professor Amitav to Professor Rau as well. Another mm. two questions to Pro Professor Rau Mishla is, what do you mean when you refer to institutionalizing the Indo-Pacific? So that is the first question for uh, Professor Rau Mishla. And then the next question is, what is the future of the Act East policy how do you expect it to evolve from its current state? I think this is also concordance with the uh, questions that Professor Amita Fajir also passed to you. And there's one more question for uh, Professor Surat Hora Shaikun. What is your flank opinion on how to be how to avoid rising ASEAN nationalism? Is it good for ASEAN? So please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pati. Um, Excellent questions. I'll, I'll start with the institutionalization of Indo-Pacific. I think initial steps have already been taken. If you look at uh, the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative or the Sagar Initiative, there is no military dimension to it. I think it is important for academicians to highlight that the minilateral, trilateral initiatives, include quadrilateral also, are the ones that are meant to deter China. And these military, milis, militaristic, uh, minilateral and, and uh, multilateral 
mechanisms were have always been there during the cold war also uh, the key asean the founding five members were also part of the american uh, security alliance mechanism and they uh, they were like uh, non nato allies for instance so these things were already uh, were always there what we are looking at is for the wider indo pacific region there are these steps that are being taken and uh, uh, i i think at least the proponent countries are working towards that in uh, indonesia for example came up with this idea of indo pacific treaty that was not uh, well received but at least it came up with something india is currently holding uh, and i think uh, professor pravee day is also his institute is also involved in in the uh, the indo pacific business summit where the trade ministers and finance ministers of countries across the region are uh, putting their heads together to uh, to uh, uh, to brainstorm and think about possible economic uh, non traditional security platforms that could uh, deal with indo pacific uh, uh, issues so i think institutionalization is happening and there i think we we should also uh, take a lesson from history uh, for example the asia pacific the construct of india asia pacific sorry the concept of uh, asia pacific did not come in one shot i mean it before australia and japan came up with this idea it was uh, uh, it was japan in the 60s and uh, uh, korea of course by proxy so pacific asia to asia pacific it took roughly 20 25 years and that again was a uh, uh, you know it was a, a piecemeal approach so only by 1989 we we found something as uh, strong and as concrete as indo as asia pacific so i think in case of indo pacific also that's a possibility and there is something that we have to look at i think there uh, the guiding spirit at least for the proponent countries is the only way to predict the future is to invent it and that's what these countries are doing they are trying to devise a regional order which is in their interest and uh, of course th that's why the nature is uh, strategic coming yes. to the china threat i think china has always been a threat to asean member countries the very origin of asean establishment uh, was because of china and china even at that time was uh, equally angry if not more i mean it was back then it was considered an anti uh, communist bloc so today i think things are things are uh, more or less the same in the sense that china is not uh, accepting indo pacific but at the same time countries that are accommodative in nature countries that are trying to present a more uh, sort of benign image of indo pacific uh, are trying to uh, to reach out to china uh, mm -hmm. even if it is not directly and there i think asean's contribution is important and uh, so is japan and uh, india's contribution uh, the actis policy in one of the slides i i, I highlighted the key elements of uh, india's actis and how successful it is yes there are delivery deficits and uh, economy economic cooperation and trade partnership is india's uh, really uh, the weakest spot uh we have seen that with a number of countries even important strategic partnerships uh with the us with uk with the european union uh economic partnership is something where india falters and that's because india is still a developing a country uh, primarily an agrarian economy with a little bit of msme uh, coming up and that is where the problem lies so protectionist nature of economy which focuses at its best it focuses on um, uh, uh, import substitution is something that india has to really uh, put side and that is uh, where this the key to success lies uh, vaccine diplomacy i uh, i thought that vaccine diplomacy of all three major asian powers india china japan uh all of them were very enthusiastic but all uh, the asian powers faltered uh india faltered because of lack of resources lack of the um, uh the essential supplies uh so even though there was a, a good intention it failed 
in case of China, efficacy of drugs, verification, international standards, and so many other things uh, followed up. In case of Japan, we are seeing that the quantity itself is a problem, where India and China were initially uh, uh, doing uh, quite good. So I think it's not just about India, also uh, include China and Japan when you talk about vaccine diplomacy. Uh, they do not have enough resources to really cater to the needs of the international community at this stage. And uh, I think since all three powers tried to do it all by themselves, they failed. Uh, so perhaps uh, uh, there, again, a lesson is that uh, maybe like-minded countries should put their uh, efforts together and do something uh, even in dealing with uh, pandemics like the COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Mishra, uh, now may I turn to Ajahn Surat, please? I, I think Professor Sarish, I, 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 there's only one question to me yes. and I will be very short on that. Uh, yes. Well, you know, it depends how you define nationalism as well. Because you see, I, I don't think nationalism in this part of the world is the one that we are can we match with the kind of thing that we see in Western European textbook, for example? You know, because uh, ASEAN, for example, was formed, was established on the basis of, you know, each member states having different kinds of nationalism. Uh, well, as long as nationalism does not shift itself towards ethnocentrism, okay, then, of course, I, I don't think there's a problem. And also, we can see from during the Cold War period, and even today also, you know, not only uh, you can find nationalism here, you can also find nationalism replaces communism in China as well. You can also find nationalism in India as well. So to what extent are we talking about? And according to my observation and experience, it's very simple that, you know, uh, ideologies are important, but they cannot overwhelm national interest, okay? So, I mean, you can be of different kinds of um, um, ideological camps, but then you can still, of course, uh, talk to each other and cooperate with one another. And even though you have same, you know, ideologies, but if the interests are not mutual or it contradicts with one another, then there could also be conflict as well. So, I mean, it depends very much, you know, what kind of nationalism are we talking about here? And, and, and let's see also how ASEAN take it from there. So it depends what kind and whether it's good or not. It, it, I think ASEAN was formed on this kind of each member state having different kinds of nationalism. But in the end, they, they came together five and then six and then, you know, um, because they have, you know, common threats. Thank you. Thank you, Jan Surat. Uh, I guess the, uh, Professor Claire might have one que some question to the speakers. Uh, may yes. I have you as, a, as the last? And yes. then I, I think we would like to conclude. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for uh, giving me uh, uh, the opportunity to just to have um, ask a question to Professor Acharya. Um, you was talking T uh, telling that after Bandung, uh, uh, India was not so, uh, didn't play any more uh, role in, in Southeast Asia. I would like just to mention that, in fact, in Vietnam, uh, India was a part of the International Commission of Control. It's true that they failed in the, uh, um, um, uh, solving the, uh, um, avoiding the war, but uh, at that time, India was uh, trying to uh, uh, avoid the war with uh, Polish and um, and Canadian, and uh, I, 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 I work about uh, the Vietnamese who try during this period to uh, find a third voice, uh, between, third path between communism and, 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 and uh, the Americans, and they really try to see if India can help them, and at that time it was a failure uh, for many reasons, uh, and uh, I would like to have your opinion, Professor Acharya, about um, uh, so at that time, during the Cold War, India <clears throat> was close to China, in fact, more, they were neutral, but more close to China. At the moment, it's a bit different, I think. And what, uh, how do you connect the two yeah. periods um, today? And do you see new contexts 
new perspective, uh, um, new um, new tools, because at that time India was not, even if the, the idea of neutralism was very, uh, in Vietnam, they, um, many, at many periods, uh, this idea come back, but there were uh, no troops and uh, the Cold War was so hot in Vietnam that uh, the voice of neutralism of India was uh, not um, uh, efficient. So thank you for your uh, comments. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's a, that's a great question. I uh, behind my book, uh, in, behind me in my bookshelf, and uh, about uh, two shelves are full of material on Bandung. In fact, I'm writing a book on Bandung. I've written uh, several chapters and articles, so I know the history pretty well. Um, so this is what happened. You know, the Bandung conference was organized by five countries, uh, and uh, they are called officially conference of Southeast Asian Prime Ministers. The term was Southeast Asia. And who are the five countries? Indonesia, Burma, Pakistan, India, and Ceylon. So three of those countries were actually no longer considered Southeast Asia, they're considered South Asia. So that's what I, one of the things I say, regions vary. India was pretty much a leader of Asian regionalism under Nehru. Uh, but something happened after Bandung, Nehru, lost a bit of ground at Bandung, partly because he actually admitted, he actually wrote a letter to Edwin Mountbatten where I said, I was grumpy, I was in bad mood, and I did not do all that well. Uh, in fact, this is his own, own admission. So, but India got carried away. That's war with China in 62, uh, and that lost India attention and also some credibility. Uh, Southeast Asia lost a bit of respect for India. Uh, after 62. Uh, then India had domestic problems, Pakistan, war with Pakistan in 65. So it got kind of caught up in that uh, uh, own uh, uh, domestic uh, context. But also, I think Nehru decided that uh, that this, especially Krishna Menon, who was his defense minister, uh, decided that Southeast Asia is too small a playing field for India. India would uh, do this in the global level. So the UN Commission, uh, the, the uh, Indochina Commission and all that was good, mediating between even US and China, Krishna Menon tried to do that uh, over, tai over Taiwan. That is also good, but Southeast Asia, India kind of left Southeast Asia. And there were all kinds of issues there. It was not also when Southeast Asia opened up uh, to the global economy, India did not. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why India did not get part of this uh, East Asian integration process. East Asian integration, uh, the institution was created much later, but uh, uh, but actual integration has happened much earlier. Indo-Pacific still doesn't have that integration uh, in the same way. And the production network supply chains, nowhere uh, comparable to what happened in East Asia, Asia Pacific. But to go back to your question, uh, again, to uh, India's role, uh, India came back to the region again, thanks to Narasimha Rao, uh, and uh, when it looked like the Lukis policy. So there was this period uh, where India was kind of missing in action so to speak, to, uh, in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and Indian diplomacy focused more on South Asia or Central Asia and the global stage rather than Southeast Asia. In, in, in fact, there was an opportunity to build a very close relationship with Japan after India fell out with China, uh, but that opportunity was missed. I'm sure many Indian uh, scholars will have different views on this, uh, but uh, uh, India's role in Southeast Asia was uh, not very robust, not very well thought out during that period until then the Narasimha Rao and, and subsequently India has been really doing pretty well. But still there is a perception in Southeast Asia that uh, India uh, is not uh, uh, doing enough comparable to China. Southeast Asia would like to see India do more. Talking about Vietnam, one of the first trips I made to Hanoi uh, and uh, you know, the same thing uh, to the what is now the Diplomatic Academy. Uh, the Institute of International Relations then. Uh, I have actually many students that are working there now. Uh, the, what I heard from there is that, again, India, uh, you know, honestly, Vietnam did not support India uh, to be an ASEAN member, uh, when, or to be a member of uh, APEC. Vietnam did not. And because when Vietnam itself was trying to get into uh, ASEAN, and which did it very successfully, it was Singapore who actually backed India's membership into all these institutions. 
Uh, so so if, uh, India has to be grateful for any country, it was Singapore. Singapore for strategic reasons, as a counterweight to China, got India uh, lobbied very hard for India to be in the ASEAN Regional Forum, in East Asia Summit. So this history, um, I, I'm happy to talk to you separately on this. Uh, but I think the, the, the bottom line is we do have a construct uh, called Indo-Pacific. And I'm not opposed to it myself, but I just see it as a different uh, in character, in makeup, than the previous sort of regional concepts uh, that uh, we have in the region uh, from Asia, Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific without a hyphen and with a hyphen, uh, East Asia, Eastern Asia. Now we have Indo Pacific. Maybe it's day will come. If uh, Marty's, uh, Martin Aklaga was uh, in the Pacific Treaty, which he was very passionate about, I, I, uh, I know him very well. Uh, and spoke to him many times about this. He was very passionate. If that was adopted, if you have an Indo-Pacific Treaty, in fact, uh, that would be a great thing for Indo-Pacific. But here is the problem. China will not accept any Indo-Pacific institution uh, unless it is, not, uh, it is seen as not being dominated by US. And if China is not a member of a institution, I'm not defending or criticizing China. If China is not part of an institution in the region, there will be no institution. Uh, uh, let's put it this way. I mean, and also China today, it wasn't China 10 years ago. China had substantial soft power in Southeast Asia and it may get regain it. Uh, you know, China also have, will have political change uh, and, uh, and, uh, so, and Chinese do learn. So if you want to build an institution in Indo-Pacific similar to APEC, uh, ARF, East Asia Summit, you have to find a way to make it, bring China in. Uh, and can you do that if you have the quad? I don't think so. Uh, so you have to dissociate quad from Indo-Pacific. That's why the Indonesian proposal, uh, for, or uh, what, the, what the, <clears throat> so, uh, we just heard the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific. It was Indonesia's response based on dissatisfaction with the Indo-Pacific concept of Trump, Japan, and to some extent, India, although India was closer to Southeast Asia, but uh, it was basically Indonesia's response to the American concept of uh, Indo-Pacific, which you thought was too strategic, too exclusive of China. Therefore, ASEAN should come up with its own document. And that was an assertion of ASEAN's agency, which uh, therefore puts ASEAN in the picture. But that doesn't mean Indonesia is going to accept an institution that's not uh, doesn't import China. It will not. If I know my, my my Indonesian friends, they will not accept it. And if without, if we don't have Indonesia uh, in, in an institution, I don't know what that institution will mean. If it, thank you, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Professor Mitaf, for for your very insightful and very uh, very much in depth. Uh, or uh, answer to the, the key question. May I now uh, re uh, ask the, the, the whole audience uh, of our, our region, I am sure there are more than uh, 500 uh, participants in, in this uh, who could also share with me uh, the sense of uh, privilege that, that we have had together in uh, having listened to the three speakers, uh, I just have, uh, because of the uh, limits of uh, time, I just have uh, a few uh, final uh, observations to, to, to relate to. Uh, the first one is, uh, it is very uh, timely that uh, at this uh, very uh, challenging period uh, in the context of uh, issue between uh, geopolitical uh, competition and also between the uncertainties of the world uh, order that demands the topic of uh, Indo-Pacific to be uh, focused and also to be uh, to be put in the on the table together here it is also important to relate this in the context of how ASEAN sense of agency uh, be a part of this very dynamic process of uh, 
regional order and also re global order, so to speak. So with this timely uh, and also with this uh, great insight from the speakers, we can say that uh, the, the issue before us is still not only about uh, speaking about Indo-Pacific as established constructs, but rather as a, a socially constructive process together. Uh, and be, with, with that challenge, similarly, ASEAN also uh, are being questioned uh, between expected role of ASEAN, but also the, the, the how ASEAN can make sense of, of this very challenging time in a very uh, proact, uh, very uh, responsive and proactive mood. So with this, uh, the second point I would like to relate is uh, the issue we, ha we have witnessed uh, a bit strong uh, approach to look at this issue in terms of the region and the order, regional order uh, beyond uh, this pandemic that we are experiencing together. But yet uh, the geopolitical or geoeconomic uh, uh, approach uh, seem to be very important, but yet uh, still uh, demand a bit more uh, uh, approach so that we can see uh, the issue or that uh, come uh, around us. The, my second point relates to the tensions uh, between the approaches to regional region making. There are tensions between uh, state-centric uh, approaches, or maybe some would say about uh, uh, new, uh, new, uh, liber, uh, you know, realist or uh, new uh, realist approaches, and it could be confirmed by research as, as being proposed, uh, being presented. But still, we see that this is the big gap between how sense of sense making and also how, how we all can make sense together that the gap between the demands and the, uh, the action that we can respond to the demands of the time are, are huge. And with that big gap, uh, we, we need to go to see something beyond uh, nation state framing of region, regionalism or region, region in the making. So in that sense, maybe uh, the challenge goes to uh, the uh, see ourselves in a longer historical understanding. I think it is already, already mentioned that uh, the, we are not only mentioning the region or Indo-Pacific as a, a purely military uh, approach as some might uh, have proposed, but we would like to see how this uh, framing could be a part, not the only, uh, but a part of a more open space for engagement in, a, in this very unequal world. This language reflected uh, on our, uh, some, some discussion even mentioned about our historical uh, approach to our own self-making in the region, uh, in the sense that we, uh, like the Bandung conference some uh, seven decades ago. So with this Bandung conference, uh, we are now still a part of a very unequal and unequal world where uh, global powers are uh, still a reality, but di of different nature, different dynamics. And so we, with that historical uh, sense-making and also contemporary sense-making together, I think we need to come to the uh, next point, with, which is at the topic that everyone have put forward also. That is the context of pandemic. Uh, the, the new context of pandemic uh, with uh, not only about the nation, stronger nationalism, uh, not, the, not only the issue of a stronger state, but the issue of how we see the role of uh, national interest uh, with limits to uh, how we frame our uh, suffering, our different uh, collaborative uh, demands together. So here, I think uh, we, in, we no. need to go beyond this to see the yeah. importance of this yeah. uh, more, more uh, human uh, interest, a global human interest together to deal with this very challenging time and 
to go beyond it, we would see the more part, not only uh, as a national citizen, but also uh, as seen to uh, some of our colleagues who are the speakers, uh, we need a sense of global citizenship uh, in coping with this uh, new pandemic and to see beyond this usual language of blocks and also of uh, national competitions and pride. But we are all seem to uh, need to ask ourselves how we can frame together in a stronger collaborative language and also how to engage with the more diversified actors in the region beyond the usual official, but go to see the more informal and multi-level uh, engagements in the region, which uh, the academic or the research need to also extend itself to realize the complexity of uh, the space open for us. Without such, maybe we would not be able to really make sense of the last decade of uh, the global 2030 agenda where we, this uh, SDG language could only be a part of a stronger sense of uh, a collaborative demands for the future uh, through with intergenerational approach among all of us. Thank you. Thank you for the honor to be a part of the listener and also to join with you. Thank you, Ajahn Piti, to, for collaborating in the, in, the, in the chair. Thank you very much for uh, the three speakers and 